Okay. Well, uh, to help my students during the checkoff process, because um, we have a, a three-part checkoff process in our respiratory care program. Um, the first is uh, an actual written test. And the written test is made up of uh, listing the goals, indications, contraindications, and hazards. I give you that sheet right at the very beginning of the unit. And each unit that we have in my class, and most of my classes, will have a therapeutic summary sheet. Because, because respiratory therapy is about delivering respiratory care. Now, can you see that on the camera? Or do I need to bring it a little bit closer? Right there. And you can see you have two goals, four indications, one contraindication, and six hazards. Okay? They're just listed. But it does say here for the therapeutic goals that students should be able to define and explain how to recognize the goal and the objective. So I'm giving you, we're giving you the goal. One of them is to correct hypoxemia. It says the student should be able to define. So you have to define what hypoxemia is. Then you have to explain how to recognize hypoxemia. If a patient had hypoxemia, how would you recognize that? The second goal is to decrease the work of breathing and decrease the work of the heart. Well, defining that. It sounds crazy, but I don't want the heart and I don't want the lungs to work harder than they have to. If the patient's short of breath, if the heart's working really hard, maybe they're having some kind of chest pain, something else is going on, that's going to cause an increase in oxygen consumption and I want to deliver extra oxygen to help that area. The heart, the extra oxygen consumption, we're relieving that shortness of breath or decrease that work of breathing. How would you recognize that? You'd look at your patient. You'd measure their pulse. You'd look at their respirations and count their respirations. You'd look for accessory muscle use. You'd look, maybe they're sweating, diaphoretic. That's more than a list. Then we have indications. And of course, we have four indications. Hypoxemia is indicated at, by a decrease in the P little AO2, decrease in the SAO2, decrease in the CAO2, and a um, change or a modification in the physical signs and symptoms of the patient. You're seeing this change in them. Uh, acute MI, suspected carbon monoxide poisoning, and the physical signs and symptoms of shortness of breath. And we actually list that out for you to identify it. How would I know the patient is just shortness of breath? What are those physical signs and symptoms this time? Cyanosis, tachypnea, or use of accessory muscles. But it says the student should define and explain how to recognize the indication and give examples of disease states. Now think about it. If a patient has hypoxemia, what are some of the disease states that might cause hypoxemia? Now, go back. What is the number one cause of hypoxemia? A VQ mismatch. Anything that will cause a VQ mismatch, a ventilation to perfusion mis mismatch. We want it to be equal a one to one. So if we have anything dealing with the AC membrane, that can cause it. If we can have anything dealing with the hemoglobin count, red blood cell count, that can contribute to it. If it's anything with the heart, dealing with the decrease in cardiac output or blood pressure, that can deal, uh, contribute to it. Uh, if the patient breathes in carbon monoxide, or if the patient has cyanide poisoning, you'd go back and you would review your four, well, I'm, right now we're only saying four, the four types of hypoxia. Review those, and those are going to help you expound 
on how you would identify and define a disease state. Think about it. Would pneumonia, a patient with pneumonia, bilateral lower lobe pneumonia, would that affect oxygenation trend, oxygenation in the patient? Yeah, that could be a cause for hypoxemia. What about if a patient had severe acute asthma attack? Airways being obstructed. Yeah. What if they had emphysema? Yeah. That would be examples of disease states. Acute MI. How would you identify that? Chest pain. Heart problems. Now, I like to put in there that, you know, if the patient's exhibiting any type of uh, abnormal chest pain, you put them on O2. You go to the hospital right now um, and you have a stomach ache, you're going to be triaged, and you might wait for a while. Go to the, uh, go to the ER and say you're having chest pain, you're being fast-tracked right to the back, and they're doing a complete workup on you, and you're probably going to stay overnight for observation, too. They understand the importance of acting quickly when it comes to chest pain. Most of the time, there's nothing there, but you know what? I'm not going to take the risk because if the heart is hurting and it is a, an MI, the tissue will die and I can't get it back. I've got to get the oxygen on board quickly. The physical signs and symptoms of shortness of breath? Well, it's right there. The physical signs and symptoms of shortness of breath. That's stuff that you can actually see and feel and listen. Okay? Things that are right there that you'll be able to observe in your patient. So if I saw a patient diaphoretic, breathing, they got a really scared look on their face, there's some nasal flaring, they're short of breath, they can barely speak, guess what? I'm thinking they might be short of breath. If they can't talk, and they normally can talk, and they're saying or they're trying to indicate that they're having difficulty breathing and their SAT monitor, O2 SAT monitor is going off, and heart rate's elevated and respirations are increased, they're short of breath. I don't need to, I mean, you just gotta act. And then suspected carbon monoxide. Well, anything, anytime you're gonna deal with a patient who might have been involved in some type of fire-related incident, somebody who was in close uh, uh, quarters where uh, carbon monoxide fumes have accumulated. Um, you see today that carbon monoxide detectors are uh, widely distributed and sold because homes retain carbon monoxide. And you have to remember that carbon monoxide, if a hemoglobin molecule is sitting there and it has a choice between a carbon monoxide molecule or a uh, oxygen molecule, 200 to 210 times more frequently, that hemoglobin is going to choose the carbon monoxide. Okay? So, if you know, you get a report that the patient has had that, then you can already suspect carbon monoxide. How would you treat that? We want to give them 100% oxygen. We want to overload the lung as quickly as possible and outnumber the carbon monoxide molecules. Now, the carbon monoxide is already bound to the hemoglobin, but if I push a ton of oxygen, give the patient uh, a non rebreather, which is going to give 60 to 80% O2, then there's going to be more oxygen crossing the AC membrane. Now, oxygen no, not only binds to the hemoglobin, it also dissolves in the plasma. So I'm going to increase the overall O2 content, total O2 content in the arterial blood. And what will end up happening, because I've increased the partial pressure of oxygen in the lung, and if I calculated how much oxygen was available in the lung, I'd use that formula called the alveolar air equation. Barometric pressure minus water vapor pressure times the FiO2 minus BaCO2 divided by R. R is your respiratory quotient. We've said that we're going to use 0.8 if 
patient has normal lung function. That respiratory quotient is the amount of oxygen consumed divided into the amount of carbon dioxide produced. And if the lungs are functioning normally, it's going to be 0.8. While doing that, I'm subtracting out the carbon dioxide. Because all I care about with the PAO2, PBAO2 formula, alveolar air, is how much oxygen is in the lung. I'm subtracting out the water vapor, which takes up space, and I'm subtracting out the carbon dioxide. So all that's left in the lung is oxygen. That's what the alveolar air is. How much oxygen is available at the alveolar spot in the lung. I increase that. I'm going to increase the opportunity for oxygen to get across the AC membrane, solvent to the plasma, and eventually decrease the half-life of the carbon monoxide on the hemoglobin molecule. If I want to speed up the process, hyperbaric chamber if you have it available. If you don't, maybe CPAP. Do you, when you're doing this therapeutic summary sheet, you're looking at answering the question, not just listing anymore. It has to mean something to you. Because your clinical sims are going to be based on this. Your exit exams from our program, when you go to get your RRT, it's not just can I answer the question, but can you use the information you've gained over the last two years in a constructive manner to be able to provide excellent, again, excellent health care. And to be a, an outstanding respiratory therapist, okay? We're not just there for a job, we're there to change lives. We're there to help. Contraindications, depending on the therapy, we have contraindications. In this sense, it says, if oxygen is not needed, do not give it. Oxygen is a drug. And oxygen, when you give it to a patient, it can cause lung damage. And we'll talk about that because giving oxygen can be a hazard, which leads us right into the next section, which is the hazards. And it says the student should be able to define, explain, and how they recognize each hazard and how to prevent or reduce the occurrence of this hazard. Well, you had ROP, retinopathy of prematurity or retrolytal fibroplasia, and that's dealing with low birth weight infants. And you can watch the other YouTube clip I have on this. But we don't want to give them too much oxygen because we know it can cause, eventually cause blindness. And it's something that we can prevent. Do no harm. Keep your head on straight. Know the basics. Oxygen toxicity leading to ARDS and non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Oxygen is a drug again, guys. It is a drug. Too much of a good thing is bad. Too much oxygen will cause the patient to become extremely ill to the point that they could die. So oxygen can become toxic. How and when? YouTube of another one of the YouTube clips. But simply, the PO2 times time. The longer you keep higher levels of oxygen in the lung over a period of time, the free radicals in that oxygen destroy the lung. And you end up having a VQ mismatch, and you end up um, possibly causing the patient to have ARDS. Another one is O2 induced hypoventilation. Think of the words O2 oxygen induced causing hypo low ventilation. What patient classification? It says you should be able to find it and give an example of it. So you would say, okay, this is a, 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 a hazard which can be commonly found in patients who have, who are COPD, CO2 retainers. What's special about them? Well, they've had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease for a very long period of time, and their carbon dioxide levels have been so high for so long that their hypoxic drive no longer works. It's shut down, okay? Just like uh, a store that was once open, working, fully functioning, and then the next day, it's not there. Well, it just didn't, they just didn't come in there and shut the store down just like that. It was gradually 
getting to the point where they had to make the decision to shut the storm. Same thing the body does with O2 induced hyperventilation. The body works so hard trying to clear CO2 and then eventually, you know what? It ain't working. We're consuming too much energy trying to blow this stuff off and it's never working. So the hypoxic drive is blunted, stops working. And the only thing that's left is the peripheral chemoreceptors that respond. They respond to more than this, but just responding to levels of O2. If you want more, listen to the other YouTube clip. Um, absorption atelectasis. Again, look at the words. Absorption atelectasis. What's being absorbed? the nitrogen, the most abundant gas in the body and in the alveoli. If I give it FiO2 levels greater than 50% very quickly, the nitrogen that's in the lung, the alveoli in the body cavity, absorbed into the venous uh, bloodstream, leaving a void, and then the oxygen that's left in the alveoli will cross the AC membrane, and when it does, the alveoli has nothing to keep it open, and it collapses. So it's given you some key things there for you to be able to define it, but then how would you know what kind of a patient might end up having absorption atelectasis? Well, patients who are breathing small tidal volume, maybe post-op, sedated, okay? And it gives you, in, when, you when you read your Egan book, it actually says when you give FiO2s greater than 50% 50, 50 or greater. So it's also giving you an FiO2 level. Now we've talked about that, you know, when you look at what you know, defining respiratory failure, and respiratory failure is, is when you have a PaO2 of less than 60 millimeters of mercury, and uh, that's on an FiO2 of greater than 60%, my patient is not doing well. They need to have mechanical ventilation assistance either by non-invasive means or by an ET tube. I would go the ET tube route on that one. I mean, there are other things, VQ, shunting, some other things, but we're not mechanical ventilation right now. But when you get levels of high oxygen having to be given to a patient, I want you to know it's severe, it's dangerous, they don't belong on the floor, they should be being watched, they should be on telemetry, and they should be monitored very closely with the pulse oximetry, continuous pulse oximetry, okay? And that should be a patient that you're checking frequently as a respiratory therapist, and the nurse to patient ratio shouldn't be very high, it should be very low. This is a patient that could get worse quick. Your last two hazards, fire hazard, we already know that anything that will burn in room air will burn hotter, faster, in the presence of pure oxygen. So we want to know that, and any time that we're using any kind of electrical equipment or anything that might cause a spark, some of the areas that you might think of, uh, what if they're doing a bedside uh, type surgery, and they're using a bovi, or doing some type of insertion and clearing, uh, cauterizing the skin, and oxygen's available right there. That could be a risk. But one of the greatest risks is no smoking. Patients continue to smoke with oxygen. And it is our job, our obligation, our moral obligation to make sure that we're telling patients, no smoking, absolutely not. And the last one, infection of aerosols used to add humidity to inspired gases. We already know that we don't do it unless we need it, okay? There's a couple of reasons. One, number one reason is that when you add humidity or aerosol to a gas, that's a water particle that now is suspended in the gas, and bacteria can accumulate on those water particles, and the patient's breathing them in deep into their lungs. And that can worsen the lung infection. If it's an aerosol, that's a visible one. Humidity is invisible, and aerosol is visible. Also, when you're using an aerosol, like an air entrainment nebulizer, that air entrainment nebulizer can collect water in the circuit. And if it collects water in the circuit, you need to consider that contaminated waste and handle it as such. Well, what happens if that backs up or goes into the patient's lungs? That's going to make them sick. Think of a, uh, we're, we're down here in South Carolina, we get those terrible rains, 
and they come on for a long time, and then all of a sudden the sun's out, and you have these big puddles of water in your yard, and, and the ground's all soaking wet. You just know not to go out after about 4 o'clock because it's mosquito fest time about two or three days later. Stagnant ponds of water. Okay? It's dangerous. Okay? And we're not even talking about if you put a heated collar or a heat that uh, aerosol entrainment nebulizer to increase the water content of the gas. When you add heat, you increase the risk of even creating more bacteria. But that's your therapeutic summer sheet. That's going to be the first part of your exam. You're going to come in here for the checkoff. You're going to sit down, and you're going to do that. The next part in your written exam is going to be questions. And they're on your data arc sheet. Now, we give you a data arc sheet. That, this is a company. And it lists, it's like a recipe, a cookbook recipe of what you need to do to be successful all the way through this checkoff. The lab is for you to practice, and I've noticed how everybody can, they can do it. But this data arc sheet starts from the very beginning saying, check the physician's order, check the patient ID, check to make sure that you have an indication, check uh, chest x-ray, history. You're looking for or you're trying to ensure that you have a valid order for the right patient, for the right therapy, to be given at the right time, for the right reason. Then you're going to employ the three W's when you go into the patient's room. What's wrong? What do I do? And when do I stop? You got the doctor's in input, you got the nurse's input, but you haven't seen the patient yet. You got enough to proceed. Okay? After that, you gather your equipment, you go to the patient's room, you knock on the door, you introduce yourself, you wash your hands, you check the patient's ID, doing a visual on the patient very quickly. Check their ID, they can respond back to you, at least two different patient identifiers. Uh, identifiers. You're going to explain the procedure to them, you're going to caution them on some of the things that they might feel, what it might feel like. Have they ever worn it before or taken this therapy before? And then you're also going to tell them some of the things that they better not do while they're wearing oxygen. And the number one thing is, don't smoke. No one smokes. It's ridiculous to hear story after story after story. Go on YouTube. Go on the news. I don't care which one, MSN, Yahoo. Go with any of them. You're, you're, you're seeing it on a regular basis. Somebody in a home on an O2 concentrator, two liters per minute, lights up and burns up their home or in a nursing home, or in a hospital, sneaking into the bathroom and smoking in the bathroom. If you smell smoke when you walk in the room and the patient's not smoking, you need to act if you smell the smoke. Okay, the remnants of somebody who already had smoked and gotten away with it, we need to address it. Um, then after you're done, you're gonna confirm with the patient and the family if they're allowed to stay in the room, do they understand? I had you do the second part, which was your patient assessment. I had you chant something. And that was, you want to check the patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, sac color level of dyspnea. Then you're going to set your equipment up. You're going to make sure that it's working appropriately. And then you're going to recheck your patient. That's all on the data arc sheet. And each one of these boxes, I'm going to be checking. And if you miss something, one of those, you're not going to get the points corresponding to that part of the check. After you have rechecked your patient, I mean, really at this point, according to the data arc sheet, all that's required is that you check their SAT or do the ABG. I've told you, you know what? You can recheck their heart rate, respiratory rate, SAT, color level of dyspnea, you talk to the patient. That's fine, because every time you walk in a patient's room, for the most part, and you're doing any kind of care, you're going to be doing at least that. You want to check breath sounds? Four on the front, four on the back, two on the sides? Go for it. That'll tell you something about the patient too. It's not just, it's not on here. It's not what's required. This is the minimum that I have to see to say that you can safely do and perform and administer oxygen therapy to a patient. Next thing would be uh, that you're gonna confirm that they're not gonna do anything foolish while wearing the oxygen. And if they start feeling anything out of the ordinary, you're going to have the patient get the nurse 
and contact you. When they agree to that, you're going to wash your hands, you're going to leave the room, you're going to ensure that there's a no smoking oxygen use sign to indicate everybody knows that it's there. Most of the time now it's painted on the door. It's become such a liability. And then you're going to pay a chart what you've done. That's your data arc sheet. When you go down the next part, it says that you need to demonstrate knowledge. Identifies this patient's specific indication for oxygen therapy. Why, when you looked at the patient's chart, why did you say, yes, this is, a, this is appropriate. This patient needs to be on oxygen. That's what we're looking for. Oh, they have a chest pain. There you go. They were throwing a PVC. There you go. They had a low PA of two. There you go. SAT monitor was going off and it was saying 88%. Their heart rate was uh, 101. You took their pulse and it was 101. And they looked the part of somebody who was high, had hypoxemia. Then you know what? There's your indication. I'm looking for that for the first question. The next question would be define or identify the PaO2 level and SaO2 level that defines hypoxemia. Now hypoxemia is anything less than 80 millimeters of mercury, but we look at it according to the AARC clinical practice guidelines in correlation to the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, saying that if you have a partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood less than 60 millimeters of mercury and a saturation of less than 90%, they have hypoxemia. Okay? If a patient had a PaO2 of 70, that's above 60. Do they have hypoxemia? Yes. They have mild hypoxemia. There's mild, moderate, and severe. MI, mild. MO, moderate. I comes before O. 80 to 100 is normal. 60 to 79% is mild. 40 to 59 is moderate. And anything less than 40 is severe. It asks you to tell me, the next question is to identify additional clinical indications for oxygen therapy. That's that therapeutic summary sheet that you just listed out for me. List of potential complications. Well, another word for complications is hazards. And you already are responsible for not only listing, but defining and giving examples and how do you prevent. I did forget this, one of the key things, wow. In an infection, Washing your hands and using aseptic technique and whenever possible, disposable equipment. If any of your equipment ever drops and touches the floor, get new, get new equipment. Make sure that you're cleaning your stethoscope between patients. Make sure you're cleaning your O2 sat monitor in between patients. Your O2 analyzer, make sure it gets clean in between. Don't go from patient to patient without cleaning it because you're spreading germs. Those are cold meal infections throughout the hospital. Next one is uh, explain the difference between a high flow and a low flow system. Okay, well, a uh, high flow system meets or exceeds the patient's inspiratory flow demand. We went through all the different types of high flow devices. You can go over that yourself. And a low flow device only meets part of the patient's need. It's, a, it, it's only supplementally adding oxygen to the patient. It's not taking full control and responsibility for all the flow the patient needs. Example, like a nasal cannula. A high flow device would be something like an air entrainment nebulizer. Okay? After that, it says identify approximate uh, oxygen percentages, air entrainment ratios, and total flow delivered by this device. Okay? So I'm specifically telling you right off the bat, based on this case scenario that you're going to receive, you need to tell me what is the total flow output of this device. You need to tell me what is the air to oxygen ratio for that device. That means you need to know the FiO2. You can use the magic box or you might have already memorized the air to oxygen ratio itself. Well, that's the end of those questions. The last part is just a judgment call on my behalf. And the judgment call on my behalf was, are you confident? Did you speak clearly? Did you make eye contact? Did you recognize the people who were in the room? Those are very, very important things, okay? 
one of the things I'll encourage you is you don't have to tell me, and now, Alan, I'm going to do this, and now, Alan, I'm going to do that. Just go ahead and do it. I just want to sit like a fly on the wall watching you do your thing, and I'll give you a thumbs up. If I get involved, okay, if I step in and say something, it's because maybe it's a big part that I need to make sure that you do it and not be uh, dangerous to the patient. Okay? Some people wanted to know what else was going to be on the test, what could be on the test. Now, this isn't going to be your checkoff, but I wanted to give you an idea of what a checkoff would be like, and almost all your checkoffs are going to be like this. Three parts, the written with the therapeutic summary sheet. The second part is going to be the actual demonstration of the procedure itself, that you do it appropriately. And the third part of our checkoff process is a verbal. Why the verbal? The verbal is because you need to interact with nurses and physicians. You need to be able not to just think good things and be smart here, but it has to come out of your mouth and be able to be effective communication so that patients receive effective health care. If you can't tell people what you see and what you're doing, and you can't write it out appropriately, then the care that the patient's receiving is going to go and you all are very capable. That's why you took English 101 and could write term papers. That means you could write at a certain level. You took public speaking so that you could speak in front of a group. Okay? You took Math 110 because we need to know that you can do a certain level of math, college algebra. All those classes were not just filler classes. They are important. And those were key classes that determined whether or not you're in this program. And you are here. So you've already exhibited that level of uh, intellect. Up here I go list the three levels of hypoxemia and the corresponding ranges I just told you. you know, normal is 80 to 100 percent, but that's not hypoxemia. 60 to 79 is mild. 40 to 59 is moderate. And less than 40 is severe. That's your three. Next question on here because we're just asking questions, because I'm trying to demonstrate, you're trying to tell me and show me your knowledge. And that would be, list the normal ranges for healthy and patient with healthy lungs breathing 21%. Okay? You're not going to have that exactly. But I know we've done this, and we've talked about this. What is the normal P, little a, CO2 range for a healthy patient? 35 to 45. Mercury. Normal PaO2 range, P little AO2, 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury. Normal SaO2, 94, 95 to 100%. CaO2, the C is big. I want you to think when you see the C being big, because a lot of students get PaCO2 and CaO2 confused. When you see the C being big, that's content. Total. Total O2 content, small a, is always going to be arterial. CaO2 is the total O2 content in the arterial blood. You need to know that formula. And that's the amount of oxygen that's combined to the hemoglobin plus the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the plasma. Okay? First part, O2, I mean uh, oxygen combined to the hemoglobin. That's uh, hemoglobin count times 1.34 milliliters times my SaO2, in parentheses, plus what's dissolved in the plasma, my PaO2 times 0 0.003. When I add the two together, that's going to give me my CaO2, and the normal range is going to be anywhere between 15 to 20 volts percent. Now, you're going to see some references say 17 to 20. Our program uses 15 to 20. Okay? That's fine. Okay? We're going to use 15 to 20 volts percent, but some of you all out there who are watching are not part of our class. 17 to 20 volts percent, 16 to 20 volts percent, it's on that high side. Okay? That's how much oxygen should be at the start of the cardiac cycle. Then we have the CVO2, and that is the total O2 content in the venous blood. That means after the blood has left the lungs, gone to the heart, gone to the tissue, dumped the oxygen, internal respiration, and picked up carbon dioxide, guess what? The PO2 level is no longer 80 to 100. It's now dropped probably down to a PVO2 of about 40 millimeters of mercury. 
there's that normal difference. And where did that oxygen go? To the tissue. After it's coming back to the heart by the venous system, it gets pumped back to the lungs, dumps the carbon dioxide, and oxygen comes back on. And that cycle continues. What's right in the center of that system? The heart beating. There's a normal difference to CA minus VO2. And that's going to be about 4 to 5 volts per cent. That's the acceptable range. If that number starts to increase and get larger, what's right in the center again? The heart. It's a circulatory problem. I have a cardiac output problem somewhere. Those are your just basic oxygenation questions. What kind of checkoff is this? An oxygen checkoff. We're focusing on that. Next on the checkoff, if you remember number six, you needed to be able to identify some different devices. I'm throwing this one up here, AEN, Air, aerosol or air entrainment nebulizer. Nebulizer is the large, volume, large bottle that produces an aerosol. And that's a high flow device. I'm asking you, with that air entrainment nebulizer, is it a fixed O2 device or a variable FiO2 device? It's fixed. Is it a high flow or a low flow? It has to be a high flow. What is the FiO2 range for that? Well, depending on the bottle. But I would tell you it's anywhere between 22 and 100%. OK? You could actually give 21%. On room air, hook it up to room air. Leader flow range. Well, the leader flow range would be that it must meet or exceed the patient's inspiratory flow demand. Whatever the patient requires, this air entrainment nebulizer needs to meet it or exceed it. How do I do that? We have two formulas. The patient flow formula, which is respiratory rate times tidal volume times six. And we have the equipment flow formula. And the equipment flow form formula is the liters of oxygen that's on the flow meter times 0.79 divided by the FiO2 you're delivering. So if I'm delivering 40%, it would be 0.4 minus 0.21. And then you do the math. That would be the output of flow coming from that air entrainment nebulizer. I told you on the data arc sheet you needed to know some air to oxygen ratios. You know, what is the air to oxygen ratio for 40%? 3 to 1. What is it for 28%? 10 to 1. Uh, I like to use things that help me to remember this stuff. Um, what is the air to oxygen ratio for 24%? Well, it's 25 to 1. I remember that very quickly because I say 25 to 1, 25 minus 1 is 24. 28% is 10 to 1. How do I do that? 28. 2 plus 8 is 10. 10 to 1. 35%, I remember the 5, 5 to 1. 40%, 3 to 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. Okay, 50%, that was the weird one. That always seemed to give me a hard time because I would have thought of it 1 to 1, but it's not. That's 60%. And I know that this is a lower FiO2, so there needs to be more, uh, more air, and it's 1.7 to 1. You can use the magic box. You can do whatever you want. But you need to know how to do the air to oxygen ratio, and what does that mean? And when we say air to oxygen, it, oxygen is always one part. And what is that one part equal? Whatever's on the flow meter. If the flow meter's dialed in at 10, it's in the, and it's only one flow meter, one part equals 10 liters. If you have two flow meters running at 10 liters, the one part oxygen, or one part equals 20 liters. Describe the effect of an elevated patient's body temperature uh, what will it have on O2 consumption? On O2 consumption, if the patient's body temperature rises, think about what a patient would look like if they had a high temperature. Probably flush, probably a heart beating a little bit faster. Their metabolism's up. So they're going to be consuming oxygen quicker. So the hemoglobin's actually going to dump oxygen more readily to the tissue. Why? The tissue needs it. Well, 
Why would the heart rate be ele uh, elevated? Well, the hemoglobin is dumping the O2, so it's got to get back to the lungs to get reoxygenated. What two values are on the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve? Go ahead, Ryan. Partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood and saturation. Okay. And so we have saturation and PO2. And on that curve, the flat portion, the very flat portion, is 80 to 100. There's not much change. That's why that's the normal range. But when we get to about a 60 PaO2, that's the steep part of the curve, and that's dangerous. And I told you, that's like skiing. If you've ever skiing, that's like triple diamond skiing. You better be really good. It's dangerous. You're going to probably break your neck and die. Okay, so you better act and really think if you're going to go skiing in a triple diamond area. Number 27 says, list four reasons that the oxyhemoglobin curve would shift to the left or shift to the right. We have pH reasons. We have CO2 reasons. We have temperature reasons. We have the 2,3 DPG reasons. And we also have the abnormal hemoglobin situation. And you need to know why it would shift, and why it would shift to the left, and why it would shift to the right. That's a whole other discussion, and we've already gone over time here. And I know I have a clip on that. At the same time we were talking about the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, we said something about the P50, the normal P50 being 26.6 millimeters of mercury. Okay, you can memorize that. That might be a regurgitation question. But what's important by that? That is when the, the, the hemoglobin is 50% saturated. And when it's completely normal on the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve, that number is going to be right around 27. If you notice that that P50 number is 30, the curve is shifting to the right. So it's a right shift cause for the curve. If the number is less than 26.6, it's a left shift curve, and it's a left shift cause. So it tells you, it indicates to you what the problem is, that P50 number. Fill in the equivalent conversion value for two atmospheric pressures. Okay, one of the things that we had talked about, one atmospheric pressure equals 760 millimeters of mercury, you can interact, interchange that with TOR. You can also have it equal 14.7 pounds per square inch. You can have it 33 feet of seawater. You can have it equal 29.9 inches of mercury, or you can have it as 1,034 centimeters of water pressure. Or for some other people who might confuse my students, and I apologize for that, centimeters of water pressure. The reason that's important is because you have one value. They all equal one atmospheric pressure. One atmospheric pressure is our barometric pressure. When we get into hyperbaric oxygen and we want to increase the barometric pressure, we're going to be using atmospheres. How many atmospheres? I mean, two to six atmospheric pressures you might be applying when you're giving a patient a hyperbaric treatment. So if you know that, and I'm asking you what is two atmospheres, you would just double the number. Number 31, list and describe the three-tier patient evaluation process implemented by a great RT. A great RT. Every time you're walking around, you should be asking yourself the three W's. That's John Evans' thing. That is an awesome, awesome thing to remember whenever you're dealing with respiratory care and delivering it to the patients. Number one W, what's, what is it guys? Wrong. What's wrong. Wrong. wrong? Second W, what do I do? What do, I do? And the third one, when, when do, I do I stop? Ask yourself those questions. But if you can't identify what's wrong and you don't know what normal is first, you can't do anything else. So you first got to know what normal is. And when you know what normal is, then you can say this isn't normal. What do I do? Well. Depending on your knowledge level and where you are, you might act and do according to your policies and what you've been credentialed for, or you might be contacting the nurse and the physician and collectively as part of that healthcare team, 
determining what's the next best option for your patient. And the last part is, when do I stop? And the when do I stop is, when whatever you started, whatever the reason you started the therapy has been resolved, that's when you stop. The underlying condition that caused the patient for you to act and give them the care, when that condition has been resolved, cured, fixed, I can stop the care. It's not when I run out of money. Okay, this is a patient case scenario that you can kind of look at. You can kind of expect. It says patient case scenario one. The following patient is returned to a recovery room following open heart surgery. So they've had surgery. Do you think they've had blood loss? Yeah. Yes. Okay. It's also dealing with the, the heart. Okay. Remember our goals. Okay. Remember what carries oxygen throughout the body. What circulates the oxygen? The RT, meaning us, respiratory therapist, has extubated the patient and placed them on a 40% aerosol mask. Each of those key parts, heart, surgery, extubated and placed on, here I underline 40% aerosol mask. They've extubated the patient. Why? The patient no longer needs to be in the, what was wrong? They needed somebody to breathe for them, okay? What do I do? Put the tube in. When do I stop? When they can breathe on their own. Why am I putting them on this aerosol? Well, the tube's been in their throat, probably caused some irritation, hoarseness, and they need some supplemental oxygen to get them over the hump as the sedation wears off. And they might be in a little bit of pain from the surgery. And they're in that recovery process. So I'm going to use a cool mist aerosol. I need to know that that 40% aerosol is a high flow device that needs to meet or exceed the patient's inspiratory flow demand. I already know 40%, I've done it so many times, it's a three to one, uh, three to one air to oxygen ratio. And it says that this aerosol mask is running at 10 liters per minute with the following data. I'm giving you the barometric pressure, I'm giving you a tidal volume of 600 cc's, I'm telling you the respiratory rate and the saturation on the pulse ox, SpO2, and the SaO2 is 93. So 93 and 94, the pulse ox, SpO2 is 93, and the saturation in the blood gas is 94. So they're correlating very close. We got a blood gas on this patient, and the blood gas says the patient has a pH of 7.40, PA2 of 80, a PaCO2 of 40, and a bicarb of 24. I would hope that you would say, hey, that's a completely normal blood gas. Okay? Is the patient's hemoglobin is 10 grams. Is that normal or abnormal? You can say it out loud. Abnormal. abnormal. What's the normal range for hemoglobin? 12 to 16. 12 to 16. So we have a lower hemoglobin. Why do you think it might be low? Surgery. Surgery. Surgery blood loss, right? Iron supplement. I might not probably jump on giving them blood yet. And I know that the patient has a PVO2 of 40. They have an SVO2 of 75%. Now all that information has to be there so that you can do your formulas, but you've already said you know. The very first one I hear, and I put it here, show all your work. I can't give you, I can't identify what you're missing if you just put an answer down. And if you only put an answer down, you can't follow the instructions, then you're just gonna mark it wrong, okay? If you get it right, Fine. If you get it wrong, it's wrong. But I don't know how, and if, since you didn't write anything down, I will just, you'll have to figure it out. Okay? Going through the steps logically is very important. Okay? Using your math skills that you've learned. Remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, the order of operations. It's very important what we're doing, what we do. The first question I have here is calculate the AA ratio and identify if it's normal or abnormal. Well, guess what I didn't ask you? Calculate the alveolar error. Why would I? You have to do it for the AA ratio. If you get that number right, then I already can assume that you got the alveolar error equation correct. What is the normal AA ratio? 80 to 100%. If it's less than 80, I have a problem. It's abnormal. 
the AADO2 or AA gradient? How much oxygen is available in the alveoli compared to how much oxygen diffuses across the AC membrane into the arterial blood? If that difference is greater than 30 millimeters of mercury, that's what we use in this program, then I know I have a diffusion problem or some type of VQ mismatch. The larger the number, the greater the VQ mismatch. And if that VQ mismatch gets really, really, really bad, it's like a VQ mismatch on steroids, it's actually no longer called a VQ mismatch, but the blood's just shunting right by. We have plenty of perfusion, but no ventilation going across the AC membrane either way. Then I ask you to calculate the CA minus VO2. Well, if you calculated the CaO2 correctly, use that formula, hemoglobin times 1.34 times the SAO2, parentheses, plus my PaO2 times 0 0.003, Henry's Law. Put that together, came up with that number, that's your CaO2. Use the same formula, but instead of using arterial numbers, use venous numbers. And you're going to come up with that number. If you come up with 20 balls percent for the CaO2, and you come up with 16 or 15 for the CvO2, it's 20 minus 15, and that is 5. 4 to 5 balls percent, anything less than that 5 balls percent is acceptable and normal. I'm asking you based on that equation up top, I mean based on a piece of equipment, is that oxygen setup, that 40% aerosol mask, running at 10 liters per minute, is it a high flow or a low flow? Well, you have to do the equipment total flow formula. You have to do the patient inspiratory flow demand formula. And that patient's inspiratory demand must be met by that equipment, or that equipment must exceed the patient's inspiratory flow demand. If it does, then it's operating fine. Quick down and dirty way is to, when you hook it up on the patient, the aerosol mask, if the patient takes a breath in and you still see the mist billowing out, you're good to go. But if the mist goes away, it's not meeting. It's a low flow. It's not I, operating, pardon me, it's not a low flow. It's not operating as a fixed high flow device. It's not set up appropriately. And the fix would be add more flow. And that might be changed to a high flow aerosol entrainment nebulizer or do what we're doing in our checkoff, a double high flow or a tandem high flow setup. Describe how an oxygen blender works or operates. Well, you have 250 PSI gas sources that are coming in, air and oxygen, and they meet together and they are mixed and they're um, in certain proportions based on what you dial in on the front. If you want 40%, you're going to have a certain amount of air mixing with a certain amount of oxygen, and there's a valve in there called the proportional valve that adjusts based on the FiO2 that you desire. Um, if one of those high pressure hoses comes disconnected, it's going to alarm. You know that. Or if the pressure drops too low on either the air or the oxygen, it's going to alarm. Um, what is the normal PAF2 range for a 72-year-old man who lives in Washington, D.C.? Okay, we kind of use a number that, you know, for every year over the age of 60, you decrease the range by one millimeter of mercury. This gentleman is 72, so it's about 12 millimeters of mercury, different from the normal range of 80 to 100. So just subtract 12 from 100, which would be the high number now, 88, and 12 from 80, which would be 60. So the normal range for this 72-year-old man is 68 to 88. In Washington, D.C., oh, he's trying to trick me. No. That's just some stuff out there. See if you'll play. Does it really matter there? No. If I told you Denver... I told you some other place at a really high elevation, we can talk later about that. But th this is a basic oxygen checkoff. I'm not here to trick you. I'm here to see can you do the basic oxygen setup. What is the difference between a galvanic and polarographic O2 analyzer? The galvanic fuel cell doesn't require any type of external electrical impulse 
to uh, cause the electron transfer from one pole to the other. Once it's open to room air, it constantly is reading O2. The reason you see it on the, di on the uh, box, the O2 analyzer box, is because that's a digital readout that requires a battery for the digital part. Now with the polarographic, they look the same, but the polarographic uh, O2 analyzer actually needs some type of external electrical impulse to cause the reaction of electron transfer going back and forth. And in the next unit, we're going to go deeper into the O2 analyzers. But that's the basic difference. They're very similar. One uses electro needs an electrical source to have that electron transfer, and the other one doesn't. One that we're using is the galvanic, also known as the Clark electrode, which does it. Uh, question number 40, calculate the duration of an H cylinder with 1800 PSI of an 80-20 mixture of heliox with the flow meter measuring 12 liters per minute. You'd have to remember that the duration flow formula is tank pressure times tank factor divided by the flow. Now what's different here is that this is an 80-20 mixture that oxygen flow meter has been calibrated for an, a heavier, denser gas. So the reading that you're getting on that flow meter is not accurate because heliox actually is a less dense gas. So we're going to multiply that flow by a factor of 1.8. And so 10 times 1.8 is 18. So now I'm going to, instead of putting 10 at the bottom for the flow, I'm going to put 18. And I'm going to do my math tank pressure times tank factor. That tank factor converts the tank pressure into liters of oxygen available inside that H cylinder. And then what you end up having, once you cancel out the liters, is a total amount of minutes, and that's your duration. That's your check off, that's your verbal. I'm gonna ask you things about O2 hazard, one or two, answer the questions quickly, concisely, and you'll do fine. I hope that helps.